My name is Sean Backus. I'm a children's pastor. I'm a father of two boys. I have a 15 and a 12 year old. And then I tease people all the time because, I, I don't know, I guess here I get to brag on myself for a second. They go, Sean, you're such a good parent. And I go, yeah, and I cheat. And, and they look at me kind of dumbfounded when I tell them that. And I'm like, I got to practice on other people's kids way before I ever had to do it with my own. And so I, I'm going to share today out of experience. I'm, a, I'm working on a, being a children's pastor for almost 20 years. I've um, been in Royal Rangers and working with men and boys since I was um, 16 years old. So I got my gold medal of achievement. They stuffed me in a room with, with other boys and said, hey, you're a leader now, so learn. And so I did, and, and I've had some success with that. And then I'm just going to tell you, I handed out a handout. It's got lines where it, where it would have blanks. I already filled them in because for me, it's hard to, you know, I don't want to miss something. So I have some of that so you can see when I hit it. And then some of it you're going to go, well, that's not on the paper. Right, so just write it in the margin and do some different things because I know that you're very, very smart and you could read this paper. But I am going to read some of the statistics just so that you can hear. So the big thing that I want you to hear from me today is I think it's very important. Multi-generational is a big thing for me. I think that we need mentoring involves multi-generations because it means someone with more experience gets the opportunity to share with someone that has less experience. How many know that even as a kid, a kid can mentor someone else, can't they? So that, that's just how it works. I mean, so a seventh grader has a wealth of experience that a third grader does not have. And, and you want to know what? I think that if we give them healthy opportunities, I think we can keep both boys on task. And I think that's what I want to promote today. But then also, how many know that every person we, how many have a cool uncle? Who has a cool uncle? You know, who, who has... Who has a grandparent or a grandpa that was just influential in your life? Does it, would anyone raise their hand on that? Me too. Me too. And, and so, so here's the deal. We're going to describe some of the problem first. I'm just going to give you some comparisons, girls to boys. Um, compared to girls, boys are three times more likely to be registered drug addicts. So 300%. Four times more likely... Four times more likely to be diagnosed as emotionally disturbed. Five times more likely to commit suicide. Six times more likely to have a learning disability. How many, how many have someone in your church right now, a boy in your church, that, that, they, that you can look at them and you know that they feel defeated because they feel like they have a learning disability and they're stupid, right? So this is, this is the enemy that we're fighting. 12 times more likely to commit murder. In addition to those statistics, boys make up 90% of those in drug treatment programs, 95% of minors in the juvenile court system. And then, so why? Why is that? I think that there's some reasons for that. I'm going to share a little bit about that on why there's some reasons. First of all, is boys are different than girls. They just are. We're wired different. And... I, I picked this up in a, in a seminar just very similar to this where we traveled around and went to different speakers. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with this name, but Gary Benton, is the, he's a licensed marriage and family counselor that is actually on staff at Life Center. And he is incredible. And so if, if you want more of this, you can give me a call and I'll put you in contact with him or call him directly at Life Center. But he had a little thing and he showed us, how many know that we have two parts of our brain, right? You know, right brain, left brain, you know, we, we learn about those things, right? Well, here's the deal. How many know that there's connective tissue between the two? Okay, well, here's the deal. You ready for this? I'm going to describe girls, and then I'm going to describe boys. Are you ready for this? So girls have wide, well-traveled connection points between the two hemispheres of their brain. So we'll call them highways just for fun. Well, guess what boys have? Dirt trails is how I would explain. Boys have dirt trails between the two segments of their brain. Are they straight and narrow? They are not. I think they're curvy and they have sharp turns and you can get lost out in the woods sometimes with them. 
But how many? We're smiling and laughing because it's kind of funny. We have one lady in this room right now. Last year I taught a boys' class and it was full of ladies in here. So this, is, this was a lot different than I expected when I showed up today. But how many think that just the makeup of our brain, how many think that affects how we work with the people in our ministry? So, so if we know that information, guess what? The number one fact of what I just showed you, guess how it manifests itself? Boys do not multitask. They don't. They do not have the connective tissue to do it. And we're expecting them. We want to give them large numbers of instructions. And then we wonder why they wash out on number two. Does that, make, does, does that resonate with anyone? Can anyone raise their hand? I mean, I have two boys at home. And I've learned. I give them one thing to do. They go up and do it. And then I say, the second thing, number th two, is check back in with me. And you want to know what? I have a pretty high level of follow through at my house because they know to check back through, check back in, and they do well. But I'm, I'm learning to embrace them and how God made them, right? So that's important. And then, then here, here's kind of a funny thing. How many have heard a little boy say, why? You give them an instruction, they say, why? Did you know that they don't mean why? They mean how. When a girl asks why, she means why. When a boy asks why, he means how. How many think that that should influence us on how we communicate with the boys in our ministry, huh? So when they ask why, we don't give them why. We, ex we should explain how to get to the why. Does that make sense? That's just something. Put it in your pocket. Keep that with you. Because they say why, but they mean how. And then... Then here, here's kind of a fun one. How many have kids? How many have boys at home? Okay, well here's the deal. So this is Gary Benton again. This was one of the gems in his seminar that I went to. He said, in matters of discipline, a lot of times we want a, a consequence is we take things away, right? He said, with boys, they've done tons of research. You don't take away from boys. You add. So if they do something wrong, you add a consequence. With girls, you subtract. So a girl misbehaves, you take away her cell phone. With a boy, who cares? You know, they're going to count the stars, count the dots on the roof anyhow. So I mean, you can't really take anything away from them. You have to add to them. And it's, it's kind of funny because as I'm sitting there, my dad had a pile of rocks in our yard. And... Every once in a while, I would do something that was um, required discipline, and my dad would put me to moving that pile of rocks. And so I'd move the pile of rocks from one part of the yard to another part of the yard, and then I'd come back in and tell my dad I had completed the task, and I'd ask him why, and he goes, well, I just didn't want those rocks there anymore. So, so then I would do something else, and I'd move the rocks again. And then after a while, I became frustrated, and I went to Dad, and I go, this is just about me moving the rocks all around. And he goes, well, you might be close to learning your lesson then. <laughs> so you add. And then here's the last thing that I'll say, because we're going to get right into the... F Women build relationships face-to-face. -face. Men build relationships side-to-side. -side. And I'm going to describe two things real quick. How many have ever ate a counter at the counter at Denny's? This is a case study by my 12-year-old son, Garrett. So Garrett, we go and we eat at Denny's. He likes Denny's. So we go eat at Denny's. We sit at the counter. He likes to read the comics and the sports page. And he goes, it's the only place where I get to go sit with men of all ages. I get to talk to strangers. And I thought about it. I thought, we do. We talk to everyone. And he goes, but you want to know what, Dad? You guys never look at each other. So it's like, hey, do you have the sports page? And the sports page just slides down the counter, right? You don't look at each other, but you're talking. And then he goes, and then my son goes, you know who the only person that you guys look at us? He goes, it's the waitress that comes back and forth <laughs> along the front who's taking care of everyone there. That's a case study from my 12-year-old son. 
He says, we sit there side by side, that you guys talk sports, you talk weather, we read the, read the newspaper, we do all of those things, and you guys rel seldom or rarely ever look at anybody until you look up to interact with the waitress to tell her that you need more coffee or you need you know, more water or more soda or if you'd like a piece of pie, right? I mean, that's, that's what it is. And we go and eat at Denny's. So here's the deal. Now we'll describe ladies. You ready for how ladies? Do ladies sit at the bar at Denny's? I have been a ton and I have never... The only lady that I've seen that has any even interaction with that counter is the waitress who's paid to. No ladies sit up at the counter. And you want to know what? They want to sit at a booth and they want to face each other. And then we'll take it a step forward to Starbucks. How many know that you and I would never sit in those chairs close enough to where our knees touch? Huh? <laughs> Ugh. Are you kidding me? It's like we want a barrier. You know, we want the table in between us. Not ladies. They want their knees to touch. They want to be able to reach out and touch each other. You know, have that interaction face to face. So here's the thing. You ready for this? Did you know that when you go face to face with your son, guess what it means? Confrontation. Oh, to them? To them. Okay. It's confrontational. I tried to think of an activity where boys do face to face. Okay, wrestling, one-on-one, -on -one. okay, confrontational. You know, I talked to my buddy, one of the guys on staff, we, we talked about it, I go, I, go, I said, I think I found one, because I've been thinking about this for weeks, right? And I said, throwing the baseball back and forth, right? Guys do that? And he goes, yeah, but that becomes confrontational at my house too. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, well, I have two boys of varying ages, and they see who can smoke the ball in harder on the person that's across from them. And I'm like, it starts out all nice, but it ends, and so really, guys don't do a lot of face-to-face -face activities. You know, I tried to really brainstorm. If you can think of one, tell me before the end of, at the end of class, because I want to write it down. Because this is information that I'm trying to compile. Because I think all of this influences how we work with the boys, and we mentor them side-by-side -side in our church. Now, how many can think of an activity that's side-by-side -side where men and boys... <laughs> Or, or even a mom and, and boys, that they flourish. Can you think of one? Now, I wrote some down. I can do this, but I'm kind of trying to get it from you guys. Video games. Video games. Boys love video games, huh? So you sit side by side, and you interact with what's in front of you. And then maybe a slug once in a while, right? Because, hey, I beat you, or whatever else. True, video games. Something else. Building the derby cars. Okay, building derby cars. But... Let's think about this, how guys set up their bench, right? If you go to crafting things with girls, it's a round table, everybody's around the table. How do, how do men work? We take our table, slide it right up against the wall, and then we face it, right? That's, that's what, is that, no, uh, am I wrong or is that what we do? That's what we do. What, what's another side-by-side -side activity that men and boys or moms and boys, something that they could do? What's that? Carnival, right? Okay, carnival. I didn't think about that one, but that's true. That's true, right? Okay, a drive. Did you ever? Did your dad ever need to say something to you and he took you in the car? Let's go get some gas. Yeah, or my, my grandpa, it was ice cream. It's like, hey, get in the car. We'll go get some ice cream. Side by side on the front bench of his, and I talked about it with one of my friends, and he goes, are you kidding me? It's not even on the front bench, man. My boys want to dive in the back, and somehow they'll share things with me because they're at ease. They know that I can only occasionally glance up and see them in the rearview mirror. So our communication changes. They're more free with what they share because of their positioning in the car. Girls aren't that way. Man, you get a van load of girls. It's just, they, it's just chattering, right? I mean, I've driven vans for the girls, too, at church. And it's true. It's two totally different dynamics. We do a thing called Fantasy Lights. They light up one of our city parks, and you drive through with the bus. One year, we took boys and girls together. <laughs> Never do it again. We do. We do one Wednesday night, we do boys. One Wednesday night, we do girls. Just because of the interaction on how it works on the bus. 
because of the way that they're wired, the way that they, they function, and, and the way that that happens. And I think about this, fishing. How many went fishing with their dad? Side by side, right? And then one of the ladies, one of the ladies that helped me proof it, she goes, oh no, not if you're in a boat. I go, baloney, if you're in a boat, you're still facing where the lines are out behind the boat. Even if you're trolling, you're not looking at your dad, right? So you think about other things, you know. So, so we got video games, movies. Sporting events. Sporting events. So even the movies, the only reason girls go to the movies is because you want to hold hands and stuff, right? I mean, that's why the girls want to go to the movies with a guy. Because you always hear this, well, we don't talk. You know, because they want to talk. I just came to watch the movie. I want to see something blown up. I want to see something destroyed, right? So we have, it's not that we're, it's, we're different. We have to understand that going in to the thing. Is any of this making sense to you? The only lady in the room it is, right? Some of this is making sense. And so now you're going to, now you're saying, okay, well, you've painted a pretty good problem. Now, now what do we do? What do we do? We came here for solutions. So here, here's the thing. Men and boys are drawn to adventure and opportunity. Men and boys are changed by what they experience together, not necessarily by what they are told. David Moreau, Why Men Hate Church. A godly man's activities are centered in the local church and are a direct reflection of who God is and what he has done in their lives. And then I want you to listen to this really carefully. Mentoring is time. It's hard. It is. And can you as a children's pastor do it all by yourself? Can you as a children's worker do it all by yourself? Absolutely not. And now I'm going to give you some solutions. How many want to hear some solutions? And then I'm going to be quiet and then I'm going to ask you guys to ask questions. But I'm just going to paint a couple pictures. How many have ever struggled with having enough help? Me too. So you ready for this? I went to Puyallup, Puyallup Cascade Christian School, the elementary school, and one of the principals invited me over, and she said, I want you to come over, and I want you to experience our family chapel. I'm like, awesome, what is it? And she goes, well, I'm convinced that fifth and sixth graders can teach a chapel to their peers in small group format. And I'm like, okay, I want to see this. I want to see if a boy can handle this. And she told me, I went in and I asked her, I had a long meeting with her before I went and observed, and then we had a meeting after, after I observed. But you ready for this? Guess who the best small group leaders were? Boys. The fifth and sixth grade boys were dynamite. And they had, they had a sixth grade boy and a fifth grade boy work together because the sixth grade boy was supposed to teach the fifth grade boy how to do it so that when the sixth grade boy went to junior high, the fifth grade boy could take his place. And it was like they laid things out on the floor, they laid things out on the desk, they were teaching each other what they were doing. One guy was there to help him. He knew he had a sidekick the entire time. you know. And they're doing this great job. And I watched them do these chapels, and they were working off a worksheet. You know, They were, they were doing uh, memory verse games. They were doing all this stuff. And I realized something as I'm watching this. Those boys had something to do. They changed. It changed the way that they were taught. Because many times, we, don't want, we, we complain because the boys misbehave because we want them to sit still. Right? So if you came here to me to give you a secret formula or an inoculation that we could give the boys so they would sit still... I, I guess class is over. <laughs> you know, okay, thanks for coming. Because that's not what I'm trying to say. There isn't an inoculation that we can give them. This isn't, we're, we're not trying to prevent measles, mumps, rubella. I mean, we have to embra embrace their brain. We have to embrace the way that they operate. We have to embrace who they are. And we have to change the way that we present. Does that make sense? The change for helping our boys behave really starts with us. So we have to think about something. I'm going to tell you, side-by-side -side mentoring, first thing you have to do is you have to recruit more men. Because if you're going to work side-by-side, -side, I only got a couple of shoulders that I could put a boy on, huh? You know, I could work with maybe two, and if you're maybe three at a time. So guess what? If you have ten, what's going to happen? 
The good boys are going to be pushed to the side. The rowdy boys are going to be pulled close. And <coughs> you're going to leave thinking, that was pretty good. But how many know that the, the good boy that you pushed off so you could bring the rowdy boy close, that's not really the decision that you want to make, is it? So here's the, here's the thing. Recruit more people or look for the maturity in that boy and have him help you in side-by-side -side mentorship. Does that make sense? Because sometimes I think we look to recruit in the wrong area. I think sometimes we need to aim younger. Because if we aim younger, we give a boy with responsibility, we give him opportunity, and we'll see them flourish. I, I really believe that. And so, so that, that's a key for me. And, and we do that in Royal Rangers. We saw that at Family Chapel at Puyallup. And, and then you ready for this? I do it in small groups at my church. I used to spend a ton of time recruiting teenagers. And then my teenagers would come, they'd be there for a couple of months, then they'd get tired, they'd want to do something else, it wasn't cool, you know, no, 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 I like girls, you know, you know, anything that a teenager would tell you, right? So I thought, well, I got fifth and sixth grade boys sitting right here in my service. They don't have anywhere to go. They're here every week. If I train them and equip them to do this, they can do it. And then here's the deal. You ready for the girls? You're saying, well, you didn't talk about your small group with girls. That's easy. You put five girls in a circle, the small group happens. You don't have to, it, you don't have to try. No leader necessary. I mean, they're just there and they take turns. And, and, you know, so it just happened naturally. I didn't have to. So all I have to do is go around and praise them because girls want praise. They want me to look them in the eye. They want me to say, hey, you want to know what? Susie, you did a good job. Oh, thank you, Pastor Sean. <laughs> right? I don't have to manage them because they understand what they're doing. So what did I do? I became the manager and I became a mentor to the boys because I'm like, I want the boys to mentor the other people in their group. And you want to know what? I found that the rowdier kid... If I can work with them for a couple of months, the rowdy kid, they're always the ones that are best with my kindergartners. You know why? Because they have a short attention span too. So it's like... And I think about why I'm a children's pastor. Guess who? Everyone point to the room that, in the room, point to the guy with the short attention span. It would probably be me. Maybe Craig. Hey, come on. Uh, come okay, on. come on. It's come on. fair. That's it. That's it's it. fair. But do you understand? So we have to embrace their attention span and then we have to work at trying to create ways where we change our classroom from face to face to side by side. And then I listed off, I'm going to read some of these other ones. Working on cars. How many ever worked on cars with your dad? I was the official flashlight holder. Man, I had to lay there on the cold concrete and hold the flashlight. But you want to know what? You learn that way, don't you? My dad knew that he could maintain my focus on what was happening if I had to point a flashlight. And I can remember it being bright in daylight. My dad still had me, oh, get that flashlight on there. Because he knew I would pay attention to what was happening if I had to keep the light on there. Yes. Dad, there's no batteries in there. <laughs> point it. Building models. You know, watching sports, movies, they're all there. They're on the list. And then I want you to listen to this. Boys need to be mentored. How do we accomplish this? The truth is changing lives cannot be boiled down to creating lists or taking a course. It requires, requires something deeper and much more rewarding. We need to be in the business of creating and releasing real men. How many know that that's our goal, isn't it? How many know every pastor, if you, said, if you went back home to your senior pastor and said, hey, we're going to get more men involved in ministry and in the life of our, and fabric of our church, how many he'd say how many think your pastor would say no thank you? How many think he would cheer? Because that's what we want. So we gotta figure out ways to create side by side opportunities. And now I know everybody came in here with questions. Everybody came in here with reasons why you're in this class. So who's brave enough to say a reason why you showed up here? Because this is, this might not have been exactly what you were expecting, but I hope it's been encouraging. Because you have to turn it. You have to turn it on them, side by side. Anybody? I think, I think one thing I have is uh, what you're showing us is we need to create more opportunities for side by side. Take them to the monster truck rally. 
you know, do do some of those things where you can get a group of guys together to have a shared experience. Yeah. Adventure. Yeah. 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 So you have to create those because here here's the thing. Are you ready for this? If you don't create them, they'll happen in the back row of your children's church. Have you ever seen that with the oldest boys sitting in the back row? They'll create side by side. The (laughs) Right? So they'll do it whether we want them to or not. They're going to be who God made them to be. Right? So we have to think of ways to flip it on them at church and in Royal Rangers and even as a parent at home or whatever else. And then and then I was saving this one because if there were girls in here, what's the one thing that a lady can do to mentor boys side by side that's awesome? Does that, can anyone guess what it is? Cooking. Say it. Cooking. Cooking. Oh. Because guess what? You're there. You got different things going. You got things going. You're all facing. Mom isn't face to face. Yeah, if they're if you have a gas range, it's even better, you know. But they're doing stuff. They're interacting side by side, and moms don't even realize. But you could go home and tell your wife that she could hit a home run with your boys if she gets in there with some exciting cooking. Because here's the deal. A boy's attention span will be a little bit longer if he gets to eat what happens at the end. Does that make sense? It's a great side-by-side activity. And you want to know how I think about it? My dad is a fabulous cook, and so my dad has done that with my boys as grandpa. So grandpa has created cooking as a side-by-side relational activity with my sons. And you want to know what? Both my sons love to eat. And I have a 12 and 15 year old that I could put them in an apartment now by themselves and both of them would survive. And even their buddies would want to come over and eat at their house. Now they wouldn't be able to afford groceries, but if they had it, they would be able to cook it. Does that make sense? Anybody else? Any other questions? I heard a lot of, hey, we got some rowdy boys. What do we do? Because we have a bus ministry, so we have our church kids, which are usually pretty good, but then we have kids that we're picking up that have never been in church. So it's like so the one thing we're struggling with is structure and discipline when they're... Yeah, and then I'm going to... Can I be brutal on you? Yeah. You're probably understaffed. Whether you want to admit it or not, you're understaffed, and you got to recruit, and you got to get guys, and you have to start saying, hey, we want to mentor and love on you while you mentor and love on others. Because they have no paradigm of how they're supposed to behave. No one has stood side by side. Probably the only thing that they've ever had is confrontational face to face. I mean, is that true? Right. You know, you look at me for a second. You're not going to do that again. Yes. So you've already <laughs> confrontation. So I'd say you've got to come beside and say, hey, can we redirection, redirection, redirection? Because they've never had that happen because I did that too. I ran a bus ministry in eastern Washington. Tons of little Hispanic kids running around. And, you know, everybody, they, their parents let them jump on the bus with no permission slips. I took them all over town. You know, there was no supervision. So I knew right off the bat, these kids, little things that I had done with my own boys, that had never happened to them. And it was amazing how well they responded when I just came beside them. You know, lower, lower your voice redirect, give a healthy choice, say, hey, you want to know other people are watching you. You need to behave in such a way that it's good for them too. Oh, other people are counting on me? Does that make sense? And then recruit, 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 recruit. How, how many times can I say it? That That's a huge thing, but that's a great question. I don't know if that helps or not, but the chain, you got to flip the room because if you go, you know, I can only I can only get in here like this for so long before he goes, blah, 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 blah. This is more of the same of what I've had. And I didn't like it at home, and I don't like it here. Yeah. Do, does that make sense? We have to flip the room on him, side by side. Side by side. Remember, dirt trails, right? Slow. How about if we both go to look at there? You 
floor I got you. I got you. I'm not saying it's easy, but I already told you one of the answers is time, right? Didn't I say that? I said that right at the beginning. I didn't say it was easy, but I'm also here to say that it's not impossible. It's time. Side by side. Get some extra guys. Uh, that over and over about we need some time with these kids, but it just doesn't happen with other five kids and the schedules and the, you know, it's to try to get that time with them. It's like, yeah, ooh. Pima Derby is a big one. I love that answer. And you ready for this? Uh, can, what what time? Are, are we burned out on time? How am I doing? Our next somebody somebody check with me. I got 20 minutes. Okay, I got time for a great story. Okay, I have a 15-year-old, and he's a very accomplished Pinewood Derby. I mean, we're talking like he doesn't, I don't help him make his car because he's like, Dad, I beat you every year, you know. And I'm like, yes, you do because <laughs> he has time, right? So here's the deal. We're at a father-son, you know, mom, single mom, you know, anybody who comes to, uh, we call them Fast Car Fridays at our church. So it's the night before our Pima Derby. You know, some people come and just drop all their stuff down on the table, and I'm like, oh, man, we we're, just supposed to, we're just supposed to polish it up, right? And one dad said, okay, I, I want to know who's the best. I want to go in. If I'm going to spend my night tonight, I want you to put me with my best. So I said, okay. I took him, and his boy took him right over to my son Taylor, sat him down with Taylor, and walked away after I said, hey, you know, this is my son Taylor. No, 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 no. He's 15 years old. You know, he's really good at Pinewood Derby. Are you ready for this? The dad waited till I left. He got up and moved because he's like, Pastor Sean just pushed me off on his kid, some kid. And Taylor smiled, didn't say a word. And you want to know what? Another, a mom, a single mom who all of a sudden wasn't intimidated because it was like a 15-year-old kid. Well, I can go work with him because he's safe. You know, he's not a, a brawny man. You know, I'll just sit with him. And Taylor helped that little boy on his car. Any you ready for this? Guess who won the next day? The little boy that Taylor helped with his single mom, his car smoked the other guy. And the guy came up to me after we handed out trophies, and he goes, you did try to give me your best, didn't you? And I said, yes, I did. And I gave him a hug and I said, I put you with my boy. And he goes, I thought he was, I thought he was just a kid. I go, no, I gave you my best. But why is Taylor good? Because he had done side by side with his grandpa and side by side with me. And, you know, he's mentored other people and done that. And so he's involved. And then here's the deal. My, my son is 6'1", 214 pounds. And he's a ball of energy. And the kids think he's a jungle gym. And you ready for this? I put my rowdiest boy with him every time. And you want to know what? He flourishes. He goes, keep sending him, Dad. Keep sending him. He just cracks him off because he, he understands what I'm doing. Now, he, he goes, I can only handle him one at a time. But I got Taylor there, and he'll do it one at a time. And it's just that time. You create that time. And then you might not know, but you might have some young man in your ministry that has a disposition like that that you could use. You might have untapped resources for that. And then I'm going to tell you the other one. You ready for another one just for untapped resources? If you have a seniors ministry, go find guys that are either mechanics or carpenters. Because mechanics and carpenters have already learned how to teach someone side by side. Because their job has taught them how to do that. They already know how to do that. It's like, hey, push me that board. Hey, do me this, do that. You know, that's why they have carpenter helpers and stuff like that. You know, they're, they're used to interacting. So you can find a person in their job and you can do a pretty good job of recruiting on who's good. We have, oh, I just thought of another one. So Lenny Foster at our church, I recruited him. He's a chef. He goes, I got this. You know, he's used to managing a kitchen and other, other chefs and, and, you know, like that. And so he's great with our boys. And everyone's like, man, I would have never thought to recruit Lenny for that. 
But Lenny does a super job in with our boys because of that, because he has that skill set. Now, I'm not saying you can't raise up that skill set, but it's kind of funny. A lot of times our skill sets reveal themselves in our jobs, right? So can you, can you think, of, did, that, did that spark some ideas in your mind of people who, you know, okay, maybe some untapped resources? I'm not going to say that a guy that's an IRS agent, I'm not going to say that he can't work in children's ministry, but I'm going to say he probably didn't learn that skill set on the job. Right. Does that make sense? So we have to, how we recruit. Any other, any other ideas or questions? We got time, keep going. I mean, I could talk. Can you tell that I could talk longer? I mean, I'll go right back to it and talk if you want me to. Yeah, okay. All right, fair enough. How do you train your kids, Sean, to take over? You know, it's supposed to be Rangers, it's supposed to be sort of kid led. Yes. And adult initiated, but kid, sort of kid led. How do you train your older boys to do like Bible merits and things like that? Do you let them do the full. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And can I tell you why? I'm going to tell you why. Here's the deal. How many, how many understand the line if we draw a line in the room and we say line of quality, right? That line of quality is our own worst enemy, right? Oh, if I let Johnny do it, our quality will go down. Okay, yes, initially. But you have to be okay with an initial dip in quality but guess what? If you let the initial dip in quality happen and then you raise the quality back up, guess what? Now you have two people above line of quality. So we don't have just line of quality. We actually have above line of quality. Now here's the deal. It's hard. I could tell you it's hard. Because here's the deal. My guys have got on with me because I'm. I love doing little short devotionals and object lessons. And the guys on Wednesday night say, hey, it's our turn. We know we're not as good as you, but if you don't let us practice, we'll never be. And that's my buddy Dan. My buddy Dan, he, he's, my, he's my safeguard on that. He's always, he, he reminds me, now you preach this with the boys, you got to do it with us too. You got to turn someone loose and have them do that. And then I'm going to give you, can I give a Royal Ranger example so it's practical for you? Okay, so we have Ranger Kid Day Camp at our church and for our division. And Lee, you've been there. Who runs it? The boys run it, don't they? So we have 12 through 15, 16, 17-year-old boys put on that entire event. Because guess what? We think we have this line of quality. The boys that are there are kindergarten first and second. They don't understand. You're old and you're bald. You know, that's their first impression of me. I put Garrett out there who's 12. Ooh, you're cool. You're fun. You're a teenager. You're not supposed to like us, but for some reason you do. You know, win, 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 win. And then I'm there to redirect. I'm there. Because believe me, you do that. What do I have to do? I have to say... I have to pull them aside gently, side by side, and go, hey, don't do it like that again. Oh, what did I do wrong? Well, you're going to get somebody hurt if you do that. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Safety. You talk to us about that. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. They're, they're back on track. You know, they don't, they don't feel scolded. They feel appreciated. And then you have to let them, knowing that we have this false line of quality that we think is up here, that really the kids in our ministry don't care about that. They don't care that we look great doing it. They want to know how much we care while we're doing it. So that's my thing, is you've got to get the right boy that cares in front of the other boys, and they will respect their peer. There is something powerful in peer relationships. And then you have to be okay with the initial dip in quality. But here's the deal. With Taylor, I had an initial dip in quality, but now I can send any person to him and I can guarantee that they won't have the fat. They might not have the fastest Pima Derby car, but their Pima Derby car will always be competitive, because he has become an expert through opportunity. Does that make sense? All of us have become experts at what we do in our work through opportunity. We weren't instantaneous experts, right? That that doesn't happen. You you have to be okay with the initial drop in quality. And then again, here's the other thing. Lee, do we have tons of guys running around making sure they're doing the right thing? We try, right? We probably need more, 
but we have adult males there moving around, you know, making sure that they're on task. And, and we let them cook, they cook, they clean, they set up. And, and you know what? They work incredibly hard and, and they do it because there's a great pride in what they're doing. I mean, they're proud of what they've, they've done. You know, and then we, we've tried some different things. You know, we, we brought our older boys up to ranger camp before ranger camp this year. And the boys are kind of watching us do it. And one of the boys finally said, Hey, when do we get to use that nail gun? And I could see it was kind of like, Well, this is the coolest toy. I want to play with it. But we're like, Okay. All right, here, come over here, and we'll teach you how to safely use the nail gun, right? Does that make sense? Because sometimes that's part of it is that we don't release, we don't release the good jobs, right? I mean, who wants to work with someone? Who wants to be mentored if, hey, you know what, come on, we're going to clean out this cabin, and, you know, you're out framing up the front porch, and they're scrubbing toilets. I mean... Their attention span's going to be pretty short on cleaning toilets, right? But if you put them out there on a saw, their attention span's going to be a little bit longer. And then when their attention span fails and they're out playing, then I guess I go, I go scrub a little bit on a toilet, right? Does does that make sense? You you have to be willing to give away some of the good stuff too. Does does that make sense? Hopefully that resonates. But yeah, you, line of quality is the big thing. You have to be okay with an initial dip in line of quality. Can I give a lateral, yeah. Yeah, yeah. a lateral thing? So um, I, I've known a lot of guys. We get constant prayers for guys needing jobs in our church. And it's that line of quality. I'm used to getting this paycheck and that dipping quality. I will not go get this other job because it won't pay me as much. So I will have nothing. Now we're down here. So you could shut down the boys' ministry to- totally, or you could let it dip in quality a little. Build them up, let them know what they did right, and then build it and build it back in. Yeah. Just like the guy, go get that job, go win that CEO, and move up in the ranks. Right. And then when that other big job comes along that is in your field and in your wheelhouse, now you can do a lateral move and get right. back on track. That's good. That's good. How it, that that'll that'll work, won't it? Any other questions? Hey. T I M E. That's the big thing. T I M E. Time. Time and side by side. How many are going to go home and try to do something a little different with your son or with your grandson or try to figure out some side by side thing? How many? How many will promise and say, "I'm going to go home and I'm going to tell my wife to get my boys in the kitchen"? Because what? What a great thing, wouldn't it be, if all our kids knew how to cook? You know what? I tell my boys all the time. I have a 15-year-old. I can't get him to. I can't get him to admit the girls that he likes. I could kind of tell that he's starting to be interested. And I go, Hey, you know what? Your dad's teaching you right, man. And he, and you go, What? And I go, Hey, you know how to cook. You know how to do laundry. You know how to do all that stuff. And he's like, Yeah. What does that mean? And I go, Hey, it's gonna pay off in the long run. And he goes, How? And I go, You don't think that's an attractive quality to all the young ladies at college? If you know how to cook and you know how to do your own laundry and you know how to do all those things, right? I mean, is it true? We got, yeah, come on, right? It's true, right? That's an attractive quality. A man wearing clean clothes that knows how to feed himself? <laughs> yes. That's attractive? Yes. Wow. But you understand what I mean? I mean, it might sound, oh, I hope that doesn't sound sarcastic or oversimplification, but. I, I think that's a big thing, but how do we do it? Side by side. And then remember, last thing, and then we'll close in prayer. Remember, you have to be very careful when you're face-to-face with boys because it can turn confrontational very quickly. So to them, that means I'm in trouble. Or yeah, yeah. And then all they hear is blah, 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 blah. And Yeah, and that's not good communication when it's like that, right? Okay, let's pray.